Hey there, folks. Welcome to this episode of Amy and TJ. We are back on... We are back on track, which means that I am going to be introing all the podcasts from now on. Our last one, we had a little bit of a... Uh, it didn't go so well, but it might have been the best one. It was so us, the oh, last intro. Just because I started and then I wanted to stop because I didn't like how I sounded and then I got all flustered and you made the suggestion that we just keep going and everyone could and just see that I'm not the person who should start podcasts. And it worked. Okay. You know, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, when some people just aren't good at folding laundry, so, you know... <laughs> How do we get there? Now we have to. <laughs> I'm saying when you know you're not good at something and then you say, see, I'm not good at it. Then you don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> OK, but why did the folding of the laundry come into play? here? Because that's what men do. They're like, I'm terrible at folding laundry. I can't fold oh, laundry. Wow. You're not in that oh, category. Please. But a lot of guys will just deliberately be bad at something so they don't have to do it anymore. Oh, stop. that was what I was referencing. That's not a, is that a thing. That is a thing. That like is what? A thing. Like what? Dishes and laundry? Yes. Yeah, they're not good at it. OK, they don't know how to do it. What was that? We were, we were out with a friend last <laughs> night. <laughs> we had a wild night last night. We did. And I don't it's it was wild because anytime <laughs> we go over this particular friend, it gets interesting. And I don't you know, why do we keep saying this? It's not a it's not a secret. Charles Barkley is a very good friend of mine and we've gone back 17 years and he's been doing a CNN show for the past uh, several months. So now I get Chuck in town every week. So Wednesday <laughs> nights are usually lit. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday nights are lit. <laughs> yes. So we were and they get crazy. They It attracts uh, other people. And you're having oh a moment man. where you're like, how is this my life right now? Yeah. So we had that last night and we didn't want to go. Chuck, you'll hear us say on this podcast every, every, almost once a week, like, oh, I got a friend in town. We might have to go out tonight. And sure enough, yesterday was a cold, rainy, nasty day in New York. We had a long, very just busy day and man he said yeah nine o'clock <laughs> it's on <laughs> nine o'clock nine p that's a that's a late night for us we ate dinner at seven we had a couple of drinks we were early. in sweatpants we were done <laughs> <laughs> then we go out he tells us meet us at a place um and the plate the restaurant actually are they have more than one uh, oh my goodness. they have more than one location didn't specify which location. So we're in the rain. We go to the wrong restaurant. Yep. Have to get back in an Uber and go to the, the real place. I I, can't, I started telling all that because you made me think of something about the folding of the clothes. He made some comments last night <laughs> <laughs> that were wildly offensive about what men and women should do in the house. And to your point about the folding of the laundry, as a man, I, I am OCD, as you call it. Yes. And so I prefer to do things my way and to fold things my way. You're better at it, truly. But in my place, I, I would rather have my bad folding situation. And than, it's one of the many things I love about you. <laughs> that I would <laughs> rather do it poorly than to have but, you do it. <laughs> correct. <laughs> okay. I applaud that. <laughs> I do wash the dishes. I don't know. I've um what else what do I pass off on you? Um you don't pass off anything on me. I think mm. you actually really are self-sufficient, which is great. You could do a better job of cleaning up after you give yourself haircuts. Okay, that's bad. But that's okay. a little gross. That's good. And I'm not going to clean that up. You haven't asked me to. It's not, is it gross? It's just hair. Why is it? That's that's the it's, one thing that when it leaves your body, it's fingernails the most, and hair. And hair. When they leave your body, they are disgusting. Right? I, I don't want to be near them. I'm putting my fingers through your hair now as we talk. But if this is in my shower, ew. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, God. Um. All right, so that's this, that was our night and our day. Now has a lot to do. We we've talked here ropes plenty about our some health struggles that we've had, um, some minor, some major. Um, some of yours have been documented as more major, but everybody has little yep. this and that around the house. How I don't know how well of a job we do. We talk about men a lot of times in this situation. If it ain't broken, ain't bleeding, we ain't going to the doctor, period. And you've seen this probably play out with me in ways you didn't appreciate. Yes, men are like that for sure. And I, I'm actually like that too. Uh, some people get one pain and go straight to the doctor and want to know what it is. And I think that's amazing. I'm the opposite. I don't want to know. And I'll put it off until it becomes a problem big enough that I actually am forced yeah. to go. And uh, everyone, I think it's whether or not you're a worrier or not. Are you a worrier? Do you, uh, I don't know. Am I? I don't know. I don't, I don't think you are. I'm not a worrier at all. And so therefore, I always assume it's going to be gonna fine. Be all right. Right. Which is actually really bad when it yeah. comes to staying healthy sometimes. Well, it's been working out great for you. 
I'm still here. I'm still here. That's what you're going with? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Made it to 51. That's not what I meant. Um, <laughs> but look, at the house, what are the basics? Advil and Band-Aids. That's yes. kind of it. What what else is an emergency kit well, around your house? So I actually have antibiotics just because when I travel internationally and also because I am right. immunocompromised slightly because I'm missing lymph nodes, I do have I there do carry is. I do carry I antibiotics with me. I do. I have Cipro. You have two EpiPens. I do have EpiPens drawer. too because What else? <laughs> um I definitely like to carry some antacids around just in case really you eat something you don't like doesn't sit well with you wow okay yeah. mm -hmm. i don't know how well most people do uh, i think at the house we try to when something's going on i think sabine the little one's kids it might be a little different where you have the tendency to just rush to the emergency room but you don't i mean that's just parent you just kind right. of have that and you kind of want to do it but a lot of people try to avoid the emergency room some of it has to do with money some of it has to do with the, yes the coverage you have the fear of going in there but there are times you need to get to the emergency room or maybe you should just have an emergency room doctor on standby that can maybe answer some of your questions. And that's what we're trying to get at today. That sounds a lot more digestible uh, mm -hmm. to me. Yes. And so we are very, very lucky to have someone many of you may have already seen on TikTok and on social media, Dr. Daria Long. She goes by Dr. Daria, but she is joining us from one of our favorite, favorite places mm -hmm. in the world, Atlanta, GA. So Dr. Daria, thanks <laughs> for being with us. Hi, TJ and Amy. Thank you. All right, Dr. Daria, help us. What, uh, you'll, we'll, we're going to get right in. We'll, we'll talk about your viral videos and things you've talked about. Let's jump right in for everybody listening. What needs to be in that cabinet at the house? Everybody need, like Everybody's health situation is a little different, but the absolute mm -hmm. basics that need to be in there. Advil and Band-Aids, that kind of covers <laughs> it, right? <laughs> yes. I love how Amy was like, I got some antibiotics. <laughs> you know, I got some I got some IV fluid. Well, I do have some pain pills in too. There. I mean, what all do you have in there? <laughs> um, lot. No, but uh, so yes, I always say, you know, have an a non a, a non steroidal anti inflammatory like ibuprofen, Motrin, something like that. And you need to have that in whatever formulations for your ages, like adult, children's, infants. You know, I have 10, seven, and, and eight month old. So I have all the concentrations. Acetaminophen. I also then throw in, yes, get your band aids, get your gauze, get something for allergies, like a Benadryl. Because did y'all know that if you start to have an allergy coming on, you want to actually take that as quickly as possible because you want to snuff out that histaminergic reaction. So you don't want to say, oh, we're having an allergic reaction. Somebody run to the pharmacy to pick up Benadryl. You want to take it faster. So always have that in there too. That's great. Can We're I ask there, because someone told me, and a lot of people probably deal with this. I was told this finally years ago, but I, I, I had some very bad allergies that caused a post-nasal drip, ended up with a cough and an infection. It was just nasty and it lasted for months. <laughs> Never did anything but drink water and just deal with it for months. I was told the Claritin I take, don't wait until allergy season. Start, take, just pop one every day while you're fine. And then when allergy season does come, you're going to be okay. That seems to be working, but is that the advice? It's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So many people, they wait until like they're, like you said, you just look, the nose is draining and you're behind the eight ball by then. So if you know you get allergies every year, start a few weeks early to take your anti-allergy medication. That, that, and I've seen it work with you and I had yeah. never heard that before and mine's about mm -hmm. to start, so I should probably jump on the Claritin yes. uh, train very yes. soon here. Uh, what? <laughs> the Claritin train. I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to jump in with a, with a big question, Dr. Daria. What is your most important life-saving advice to the average person? Oh, most important. I mean, let's just go to the top, Amy. Like, let's just find the number one thing. I would think it would be actually no CPR, hmm. know what to do if somebody needs CPR. And that includes, I count in there, CPR, drowning, choking. Take a course, like literally physically go take a course, practice on a dummy, know what you're going to do. Because as an ER doctor, People say, like, how do you stay so calm in an emergency? Like, it's, it's not that I'm anything special or magic. It is that I have practiced. So I know if somebody is choking or comes in from a drowning or in cardiac arrest, I already know what I'm going to do. And I think that, especially for parents, but everybody listening, if you know what your plan is ahead of time, that A, helps you save somebody's life in the moment, and B, it gives you peace of mind because you're less scared about it and thinking about all the scenarios. Okay, on the CPR thing, I think a lot of, 
people, uh, and you're right, um, I've had a course over the years at some point, but that was in college a long time ago. I don't know if mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people will take the time to go do that. So in case they don't, I know you recommend that, but in case they don't, what is a, can you give a, a quick or a brief or tell them to go to a YouTube video? What, what can you tell them to still kind of get up to speed if they don't take the time to go take a course? Yes, absolutely. That Those are some of the videos that I create, TJ. That's a great question right. because, yes, best case scenario, go take a class. But if you're not going to or if you did 10 years ago or five years ago, you're not going to take a class every year. That's fine. Watch a video refresher. So I do a video refresher on like how to use an AED because just that those defibrillators that you see, you see them in the mall in the grocery store to help people be to demystify them and understand how to do that how to do CPR. I mean, TJ, when you learned CPR, it was probably still doing mouth to mouth. We don't do that anymore for yeah. adults. Yeah. You just do compression only. So here's what you need to know. You do. You see somebody there collapse, they're down. Somebody go get the AED. You start CPR to the beat of the BG, staying alive. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. just do that mm -hmm. until the mm -hmm. AED comes and, and then until 911 arrives. Mm -hmm. It is that simple. But exactly, that's why I make videos for how to handle a child choking or infant choking, all of those, so that people can come and at least watch that and have an idea of what to do. I love that you say know what you're going to do in case of because I know when I when my kids were little choking and drowning those were my two biggest fears and it was just what would I do how do I handle it how do overcoming panic is simply by being prepared correct? I think it's two things. I think it's being prepared. And then when you're in that moment, no matter what we all have the like, oh, bleep moment, just like, taking a breath and be like, I know what to do. OK, I can do this. So it's those two things. It's being prepared. And then when you're in the moment saying, I prepared for this, I can do this. Focus. Taking care of. And one of your I mean, this is also very timely. We were looking at some of your videos and some of them have gone extremely viral. And the one that really is interesting is something that happened just uh, a short while ago. The bridge collapse. We all saw it happen in Baltimore. And I think almost everyone listening here has driven over a bridge and has had that worry, like what would happen if something hit this bridge or my car went into the water for whatever reason, there was an accident and it, it crosses your mind. It's so extremely rare. Um, TJ, you looked up the numbers, right? Yeah, I mean, we're talking, again, if it happens to you, then it, you would think it happens a lot, but we're talking a few hundred, three to 400 uh, by the estimates of people a year that die in a submerged vehicle. So obviously we know it doesn't happen that often, but so many of us, feel like it could happen to us, especially after we see something mm -hmm. like ha happen in Baltimore. That's right. So I, you you put up some tips on TikTok, and I believe that video got 13.5 million views, which just shows that people want to know what could I do, what should I do if this happens, mm -hmm. even though it's almost assuredly not going to. It's interesting to see you tapped into this fear that we all have, even when it's so rare, we still want to know. So, so what is it that people should know? And mm -hmm. and I also just want to know why you think people really reacted to that so strongly. So, I mean, th that video, you're right. It went kind of wild across all of the platforms, social media platforms. And what it actually started from is I was driving across a bridge with my husband and my kids in the car. You know, again, as an ER doctor, I it is my job to think of all the things that can go wrong. And not to sit there and fixate on that, but to say, okay, so what would I do? I mean, I do that. I'm on a plane and I think if I if they call me overhead, what am I gonna do? What resources? Who's gonna watch my kids? If somebody's choking, what do I have? You know, I remember yeah, I, I know the exits. I'm always thinking about that. And I was driving over the bridge and I thought, you know, that's a scenario that I don't know what to do. Yes, I've taken care of people who have come from a submersion, but in the moment I don't know. And as a mom, that made me worried. As, as an ER doctor, I was like, okay, I need to know. So I started reaching out to, you know, firefighters, police officers, kind of first responders, and started kind of planning to do that. And this was like a month or two ago. And then there was a story of a woman who had drowned in a lake, which is really far more common. That's what we see. More, you know, far fewer people drive off a bridge and, you know, land in the water than, you know, just drive into a lake or they drive in a street that's flooded and they don't realize how deep that puddle is and their car starts to fill with water. So I had posted that. And then, yes, it was posted. It had done very well before the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And then after that, of course, everybody was looking. Um, and I think what it was, and I would get to the tips, is you know, get an ER doctor. I want you to have a plan and I want it to be simple. 
because when you are scared and you are panicked, you're not going to remember my 30 step process. You're going to remember the three things I told you or the one thing. So that's what I always do. What's the plan and how to keep it simple. So for that one, it's SWOC. And I, I did not make up the mnemonic It's from a guy who's actually studies car submersions out of Manitoba and in Canada. And so it's seatbelts off window open. And that pretty much happens at the same time. And then get out. And then he added C in there to say, you know, get the children out and get your oldest out first. Mainly because he said, you know, if you are trying to hold your toddler and then undo other kids' seatbelts, you're not going to get anybody out. Versus you get your oldest child out. They can fend for themselves. They can hold on to the car for a second while you get the other one's youngest out and then you swim out. And so another key thing he said is that especially newer cars, you cannot rely on window breakers. So literally as soon as you can get those windows down. We've done uh, stories over the years about such a thing, and I've used a window breaker live on TV yes. before, and we've mm-hmm. done demos, so it, it's Didn't always it something. Didn't it not work that one time? Were you the one, I remember, trying to get it to, to, uh, it to break? Me. It worked, it worked for, for you. For I've seen that happen on live television, too, which is actually a good thing to remember, to your point, Dr. Derry. They don't always work. <laughs> no. I bought one. I had bought an entire set for all of our cars about three months ago, uh-huh. and I'm talking to this guy, and he's like, yeah, I think they probably won't work. Oh, huh. Wow. Okay. Um, Got him just in case. You mentioned planes, and you, your theme here always is uh, just know what you're going to do, have a plan. Uh, we just mm-hmm. happen to be, I always think about this on a plane, about a medical emergency. Yeah. Like what I would do if I wasn't okay or if somebody next to me wasn't okay or somebody I'm traveling with. We happened to land the other day uh, from a five-plus hour flight from L.A. We get back at 11 o'clock at night, we land, and the pilot comes on and says, you can't get off the plane because we have someone on board who's having a medical situation. And we all had, I know people were frustrated and just have to sit there. Uh, Don't know what the person's issue was, but they eventually got them off and we got off. But when you're in a five-hour flight, a four-hour flight, a three-hour flight, and you're at 30,000 feet, and how do you prepare? How do you think ahead to a medical emergency you might have or your loved one might have, your child Mm -hmm. might have. How do you prepare for that scenario, which could be almost anything, and then you hear an announcement, is there a doctor on board, (laughs) right? And then we're in the whole airplane movie situation, and (laughs) here comes Leslie Nielsen trying to save the day. We don't want that. (laughs) Y'all, and this is one of those scenarios, I remember being pre-med and thinking like, when they call overhead, is there a doctor on board? You know, I'll be like Elle Wood to be like, yeah, (laughs) and how fabulous, I'll come in with my cape. Of course, (laughs) once you're actually that person, you're like, "Um, Uh -uh. (laughs) um, come on, let there be another doctor on board i'm here with my three kids um but just this little story my husband and i were flying back from i think denver uh, uh, denver or vegas or something it was somewhere out there going back to boston and we had just you know 10 minutes up in the air and they said is there a doctor on board now incidentally my husband is an orthopedic surgeon um but so he starts being like here she's right here she's right here okay, that's good. to me perfect um, so of course i go and i stand up and my husband's like Call me if their shoulder's dislocating. Uh, it's <laughs> hilarious. Super helpful. So, like, thanks, love. Um, and it was actually a gentleman who was having a seizure. Oh, wow. And, um, of course, 
tra- uh, you know, traveling with people who barely knew him. So nobody knew what his history. We're like, that's me. Fine. Me as an ER doctor, I'm used to having almost no information. But so on the flight, there was a neurologist. This is like a bad joke or something. A neurologist, a urologist, and <laughs> an EMT slash surgery intern who was also a diabetic. This is wow. like Doctors so, Without Borders I mean, flight. What the, hell? the safest flight this in America. Like, <laughs> I know. It's like so these people walk into a bar. No, uh, so the you that's... know the neurologist wanted an MRI. I was like, again, thank you so much. Please go have a cocktail. I'll call you if I need you. The urologist <laughs> went and sat back down too because they knew they could be helpful. The the EMT <laughs> surgery intern was great because the airplanes are so limited. So this guy actually had his own glucometer and I was like, great. Can you check this guy's blood sugar? Um, And I remember being so surprised when I opened up the plane and I've actually, the plane medical kit, I've actually done some posts on this because the FAA made some rules of what needs to be on planes, but it was done. Think about it. I, you know, I did this post about a year ago, so, but it was done like several years ago. And then since then, they've made some new voluntary updates, but not all the airlines have to follow it. And I remember opening up this metal kit and I was like, there's oral Lasix on here. Like, great. If I need the guy to pee in six hours, that's going to be really helpful. But otherwise, it wasn't useful. So what I really learned is if there is a medication that you think there is a chance your family member might need, like Amy, you said you keep EpiPens, carry them in your purse. Because you really cannot rely on that onboard medical kit to have what you might need. So if somebody has seizures, even if they're not regular, carry whatever, you know, if they have migraines, whatever their kind of abortive medication is, carry it with you in your carry on. Say have it. It's so smart. You know, you you just mentioned that. And I remember doing one of the scariest stories to me because I had just done this with my daughters. How many people go, (laughs) you're on vacation. You think you don't you're not thinking about a medical emergency. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I covered a story about this this woman and her daughter, a family, going snorkeling in the Bahamas, right? They go on a boat. They go 45 minutes out. So you're not near any sort of medical help. And a shark attacked her daughter. And no one even had a tourniquet on that boat. And so they were advocating for boats and, and places around the world to make sure they have the correct medical equipment there in case mm-hmm. the unthinkable or something that's possible could happen. But to your point, when you're going anywhere outside of you know having a hospital nearby it's something you should think about to bring with you to pack with you like i would never have thought to make sure i have a tourniquet i mean what do you suggest people bring with them and you don't want people to overthink it or go overboard but what can you bring with you either when you're traveling uh on a plane by train you know on a boat somewhere remote where Mm -hmm. you know you're not going to have immediate medical attention Yeah, well, that's a great question. I always have a little bit of a a first aid kit I take with us. There's my basic one. No matter where we're going, I'm going to have, you know, Tylenol, ibuprofen, congestion medication, some, you know, Benadryl, some Band-Aids, just because I'm there with the kids. I don't want to have to find a pharmacy. So first is just your basic, which is like, if there's a little minor illness, how can I treat it just to not be inconvenienced? That's always kind of what I'm taking. Then beyond that, when you were saying, okay, now I'm going someplace where I will have less access now I need to bring something additional. So depending on where you're going. So sometimes if you're going to different, you know, under less developed countries, you may need to bring antibiotics just in case somebody gets, you know, you're already prepared. You got your Cipro, Amy. Yep. Um, but I send my daughter to Mexico gets, with Cipro. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you might, you know, talking to your doctor before you go, like, uh, are we going to need that? You know, in my own family, I travel with you know, suture material in case somebody gets a cut. Not everybody can do that, but you can travel with things, say, okay, what's going to temporize? So I'll have pain medication, congestion, allergy medication. I'll have lots of gauze. Yes, if you really are going someplace where you could fall, get a fracture, get a cut, sure, you can take a tourniquet if you're really trained in doing that. But usually most places, just having a lot of pressure, you can use a gauze, you can use a t-shirt. You don't have to take as much. But that's kind of like my my basics that I would be taking. Will a, will a doctor give you? I mean, I guess I'm asking. I'm looking at you, Robock. I got a doctor here. I don't know why I'm looking at you. Um, will a, will a, will a doctor give, if you explain where you're going? Will a doctor give you uh, an antibiotic a, ahead of time? A lot of times, travel clinics will, and okay. you're not saying like, "Hey, give me an antibiotic, give me a Z pack in case I have a runny nose." You're huh. saying, 
I need, you know, anti-diarrheal medication in case I get this really, you know, bad illness and I'm someplace where I can't get to a pharmacy. Yeah. And there are some people, like I suggested, who are immunocompromised or who do have an extra underlying condition where they know if mm-hmm. something happens and I can't get to a hospital by X, Y, Z, I need to make sure I have right. this in my pack. And so everyone has to talk to their doctor about that, obviously, specifically as yes. to whether or not you need that. If you, especially if you have specialized medications that you need to take, don't rely on them being available where you're going to be going. If you're going out of the country, they may not even have the same medications. So I always say, also take extra. Whatever your prescription medications are, take enough for a week or two just just to have it alongside. Dr. Daria, what do you recommend? I think about this sometimes, I'm uh, just all around New York. If anything ever happened to me, a medical emergency of some kind, and I'm incapacitated, I'm not with a friend or loved one, with Robach, with my daughter, and, and there's some information that needs to be accessed in my phone. And so, mm-hmm. right, first thing somebody might want to do is look at my phone and try to call a loved one. Of course, you call 911 if it's that serious. But should we make, is there anything we can do with our phones to make sure if we have an emergency and we can't open it for someone, that they can have access to our phone to maybe find out if we have some medical issue or find out who they can call? Is there anything that can be done there? You can. I mean, some people advocate saying, you know, put in their ICE, like in case of emergency, having that sometimes Apple will let you set an emergency contact that EMT can access. You know, for the most part, when I have a patient who has something critical going on, if they're coming into the ER, I'm looking at the patient. I'm not looking at their phone. So it may be something that, you know, a nurse may would try to look at later. I wouldn't stress a ton about that, but that is something you could do is put in as an emergency contact or IC, just in case you do have somebody who is going to try to look for it. Dr. Dario, what is the number one reason why most people come into the emergency room? Oh, wow. Um, well, it depends. Um, can I give it a depend? Sure, of course. <laughs> a number one that depends. So, of course, there are things like, you know, there are a couple of buckets. There are things like traumas, car accidents, falls, you know, a- any number of things there. There are, and, and then there are just symptoms that people come in. They have scary symptoms, you know, they have chest pain or their child has a weird headache or, you know, vomiting. Any number of things. That's the beauty of the ER is you never know why somebody's going to be coming in. And of course, the number one reason differs by somebody's age. Um, so you, you just really never know. They can come in for anything, anything ranging from, you know, somebody, something awful to somebody just being scared and not knowing. And that's one of the things I love about the ER is it kind of get to meet people where they are for whatever reason brought them in. You know, what do you see, pers- uh, not necessarily a percentage, but an idea? Of course, if somebody's in a car accident and somebody had some trauma, they come to the ER. Of course, they're going to be admitted. That's one thing. <clears throat> but for the folks who just walk in, who are a little scared, who are a little nervous or something doesn't feel right, how... I guess how often is it that those people say, hey, you're okay and get sent back home versus people actually catching something that's serious? It, you know, it, 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 you'd be surprised. There are people who walk in who are like, yeah, just not feeling so great. That You put the heart monitor. I'm like, sir, you have a heart rate of 220. <laughs> oh, that would explain why I don't feel so hot. Like, do you have any idea when this heart rate started? No, but I've been feeling like crap for a week. I'm like, great, sir. Okay, you're staying. <laughs> you're going to be staying with me for a while. Um, and you might have that. You know, you might have a mom or a dad who brings in their child and they're like, you know, they just... They weren't looking right. And sometimes, you know, you give that child some acetaminophen and 30 minutes later, their fever's down and they are running around like a banshee jumping up on all the beds. And you're like, okay, they're good. Have a popsicle. Have a good night. Um, And then that, you know, a child right next door, the parent may have said the same thing. You give them the medicine and their fever comes down. They're still not better. And that kid, we're going to be, you know, doing more tests. You often cannot tell. People can be stoic. People can be scared. People can be scared, but they're scared about something that I'm worried about, something totally different for them. You often cannot tell. That's what kind of makes it tough about the ER is, you know, it's it's finding the needle in the haystack is who's, you know, find the sick. Like who, figuring out who is the sick person is, is part of our challenge. But wow. would you tell us, Dr. Darian, not to try to make that determination on our own? Because those conversations happen, happen in homes right before they head to the emergency room. Should we go? Mm-hmm. Is it serious enough? We're going to look silly if this is just a little minor headache. This is no big deal, right? How how can you coach people through that debate before they even get to you? Right. So, of course, everybody's going to have some degree of that debate. Nobody 
nobody ever wants to come see me in the ER and I try not to take offense at it, but like nobody ever wants to actually be there. Um, I get it. So, but I always say, you just kind of, at a certain point you just have to, it comes down to your own gut. No, people do not, please do not Google, do not AI, do not chat GPT your symptoms. There was a study that came out recently of on like ask me AI their symptoms. It was, it was so bad. It was just so dramatically awful, the kind of advice that it gave you. So do not do that. Somewhere I have a mug that says like, do not confuse my M- my medical degree with your Google search. Like just don't. Um, <laughs> That is why, like, I try to create content on that, too. Like, sprained your ankle, when to go to the ER. Your child hit their head, when to go to the ER. Because I know, as parents, there's just so much noise, and I'm trying to simplify it for them. But in the end, if it comes down to something that you think is worrying you, that you are afraid to sleep on because you're afraid, you know, that something is, could go wrong tonight, if you, especially, like, I always tell a parent, like, if you just say, my child's not being themselves. That's the sixth vital sign. If I have a parent, you know, their child's temperature is fine, their heart rate's fine, they're everything. My parents like, I know my kid and this, they're not behaving like themselves. Okay, valid. I'm going to start looking at that child and try to figure out what's going on. So I could give you all the rules in the world. Of course, if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, you can't do your normal things, you can't complete a full sentence, anything, can't stop vomiting. Yes, all of those things. But never forget, like, if you just are worried, you can't get an answer, and you're scared. That is why we are there 24 seven. Wow. Saw one of your other viral videos was about your own heart palpitations, and it it struck a chord with me because I I was sure I was having panic attacks. I was sure I needed to go, and I'm sure I do need therapy still always, but I was just assigning it to a mental condition, and um, I had a friend of mine say, no, you actually don't look right. And so when they did my EKG, I ended up having um, a dangerous arrhythmia, I ended up, ended up having an ablation, uh, heart surgery from it. But I was convinced that I was just having panic attacks for weeks. And it's one of those interesting things because you went through this too. As a runner, you started realizing that you were having an elevated heart rate, but you didn't realize just how how elevated it was. I believe you said you had tachycardia or a version of it. How do you know <laughs> like that one of that's I think it's a very common thing. You can have anxiety, you can have panic attacks, you can have or you can actually have a heart problem. How do you distinguish between the two? Yeah. Yes, you are so Amy, I did not realize we're like soul sisters for having our <laughs> tachycardia and our ablations. Um, oh, you had an ablation, too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, multiple ones. Um, yes. And uh, you're right. I uh, developed a, a crazy heart condition in 2020 uh, and it was dur- right during COVID and I'd been taking care of a lot of COVID patients got super sick and it, and uh, they'd never been so sick before. And then all that summer I'd go on my runs and I would have these episodes. It would, it would get so bad. Like I had to sit down cause I had chest pain, shortness of breath, but you know, I had a good amount of like probably denial, probably ER doctor hubris and being like, I'm 40. What could be wrong? Even though I know, I know so much better than this. Um, (laughs) And finally, one day I took my heart rate at home and it was 270 and it was something called ventricular tachycardia. And as an ER doctor, I I just like, I knew there was no good response and no good, no benign cause of that. So it was you know, and, and life kind of ch- really changed for me there. I know, Amy, you had your own, you know, medical scares, breast cancer and all. And it's like that moment where, you know, the next 18 months I was hearing doctors talk about me and, you know, cardiac arrest and sudden death and getting shocked on the side of the road. And um, I always tell people, though, like, you don't know what the cause is until you've gotten it evaluated. So, if you, I, I don't want people, if you're having a lot of palpitations, I don't want somebody sitting out there and saying, it's probably anxiety. I would much rather they come in, whether it's to the ER or to their primary care doctor, because usually if they come in with palpitations to the ER, their palpitations stopped by the time they get to me. So then they're trying to like, it's kind of like you go to your mechanic when your car is making noise, but it's no longer making the noise. And you try to like repeat the sound and it doesn't work. But the best thing is I say, go to your doctor get a 21 day monitor, wear that, get an echocardiogram. You know, that way you're wearing the monitor when the palpitations come on, you press a little button that knows to record it right at that moment. Your doctor can then say, okay, here are your symptoms. Here's your EKG. And they might say, holy goodness, when you had those symptoms, your EKG was wild and we need to intervene. Or they'll say, you know what? You were just having 
from sinus tachycardia, which means it's either anxiety or this is something else medical, like thyroid or something. Let's check all those things off. If we rule everything out, then we can safely say it's anxiety. And Amy, I'll have patients who come in and they'll say, you know what? I was having tachycardia, but I know it's due to my anxiety because I've had that workup. So I'm okay now. Like that gives them a peace of mind. And then that's fine. If you tell me that, then that's fine. But don't just ascribe it to anxiety until you've actually done the workout. Should we all have a, um, a way to monitor our heart rate or blood pressure at home? I wouldn't go crazy about it. No, not unless you actually have symptoms. I think, you know, the whole quantified self, we can tend to lose ourselves and all sorts of things because everybody's going to have an extra beat here or there. And you don't want to do it. If, if there's nothing, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it, TJ. Oh, but if you have symptoms, then yes. Guy would get a monitor, either use your, you know, your smartwatch, use a device like Cardia. That's what I used to, to catch my heart rate. And full disclosure, I'm on their board now <laughs> because I use them. But um, so just full disclosure there. But if you have symptoms, get a device, get the workup. And then it might be anxiety, but at least you know. I do have it. might be your magnesium. It might be your thyroid. It might be something else that we can easily intervene on, too. But to that point, yeah. I I was you. A doctor told me to get one, and I was monitoring twice a day when I was having a heart issue back in 2015, 2016. So I have it. I don't use it now, but to your point, that's exactly why I was got one and was using it because the doctor told Mm -hmm. me to. How often, Dr. Daria, should we be getting, and at what age should you start getting blood work done? Well, it really depends. you know, as women start to go into, you know, for, for the most part, you know, if you're in your 30s and 40s, you might need you might need to get anything it's like your cholesterol every so often to make sure that you don't have you know some familial or some high cholesterol for, for a reason that's something we can intervene on. Um, you might want to get your vitamin D checked. A lot of the time, though, so instead of just getting like just a thousand different things, blood work, you talk to your doctor and you kind of get deliberate blood work done based on your symptoms or based on your health or, or what you're feeling. You know, you have feel really bloated, you might get a, a GI workup done, but you don't have to do all those things. So I think, you know, in your 30s and 40s, you're going to check your, you know, maybe your, your vitamin D, your cholesterol, things like that. Then once you start to get older, then there are regulations, you know, for men, for their PSA, you know, for women, as we start to go in premenopausal, then you may want to get workup done then. Um, but again, I'm not a big believer in just getting all the blanket workup done, but really instead being a lot more deliberate and talking to your doctor, like, what should I get done now? Of course, in addition, there's like the mammograms and which I know you're a believer in and yes. make sure you're getting those done regularly. Amy, it's, you know, it's just, it's a pain, but we got to do those things too. And colonoscopy, you know, it's, it's not just blood work, especially once you hit 40. <laughs> oh yeah. It gets really it's, fun it's, once you cross 40, right? <laughs> it gets real, 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 real. I got those texts from my sister not long ago. Uh, my sister, uh, she's two and a half years older. She sent a t- random text out of nowhere. Hey, have you had a colonoscopy yet? You're over 45 now. Like, geez, this is where we are. <laughs> this is what we do. Uh, Wasn't it like the Super Bowl? It was like, if you knew all the words to that, to yeah, you needed to have a, it's time to have a colonoscopy. <laughs> oh my God. Didn't I see that? <laughs> <laughs> so are you seeing any trends in the ER that are, are um, kind of alarming to you? I know sometimes when, I mean, even when COVID was uh, first happening, the ER doctors were reporting, they were starting to see people come in with certain conditions and didn't understand, blah, blah, blah. But it, are you seeing any trends that are concerning you in the, the ER for people coming in with particular types of injuries or illnesses? I think post COVID, a lot we are seeing, you know, we did see kind of a lot more uh, kind of autonomic or, or vascular or heart abnormalities oh. simply because of the way COVID reacted. You may have heard of conditions like POTS. Uh, a lot more people are talking about POTS and or have heart, heart palpitations or things like that simply due to the inflammation that we got from COVID infection. Hmm. So I think there are, you know, there's just an increasing discussion about that. There also just may be increasing awareness about it too. Um, that's big. Other than that, I think we've kind of gone back to where we were. There was an issue for a while with COVID. People were delaying all their uh, preventive care. So they were coming in far later um, in terms of like later in their disease. We're, we're kind of back reset for that. Now it's just back to like the typical hospital and ER overcrowding, which is an ongoing issue and something that uh, that's another soapbox for another day. Yeah. Of, you know, we take care of patients in the waiting room and you might have massively ill patients sitting there in the waiting room for eight hours and I can't do anything about it. And it just drives me wild. Um, so that's kind of the biggest struggle that we have right now. It's yeah. just not enough beds. 
Yeah, wow. I mean, that's crazy. And it's, it feels like it's been like that for so long. And, and, and it got even mm-hmm. worse, obviously, during COVID. It Do- did. Dr. Mm-hmm. Dari, I want to ask you this. I know we've seen so many celebrities come out um, and they're talking about their conditions and it raises awareness for a lot of things from from cancer to uh, just, you know, everyday maladies where people say, hey, this happened to me. It might be embarrassing to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it. It raises awareness. I'm curious what you think the, the ripple effect is, if it's good or if people end up panicking or getting more worried. Um, we, we saw Olivia Munn come out recently about um, breast cancer, but I think it was just a week ago we uh, saw Halle Berry come out talking about perimenopause, but with a very flashy headline because she was told initially that she had the worst case of herpes that a doctor had ever seen. And she got tested. Her boyfriend got tested. They were negative. Turns out it was peri- perimenopause. And I'm just I'm curious what you think about, you know, everyone sharing now and it's usually for uh, something good. They want to raise awareness. But what do you think about it as an emergency room doctor? Do you have more people anytime a celebrity comes out and says something, they come in thinking, oh, no, I have this. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, you're right. There's always a, a balance. It's kind of like when you're a med student, every chapter you go through, you think you have that diagnosis. So, you know, you know, you're going through the brain tumor the chapter and section and everybody <laughs> thought we all thought we had brain tumors for a while. So, you know, so, yes, that does happen. I do think it's really valuable, though, I think, because if you are out of the medical field, like for me in the medical field, even, you know, Kate Middleton, a precancerous diagnosis at age 40. And so many people were shocked. And I remember I was like, why are they shocked? I see lots of women who are in their 30s and 40s with cancer. And so I don't think it's a bad idea for the general public who be aware that, yes, it can happen at those early ages, which is why you don't. We want to pay attention to the symptoms. I teach, try to teach people, here's how to pay attention to the symptoms without panicking. I try to like always marry those two. Like, how can you hold that duality, which is the knowledge that bad things can happen but also saying I, I have information so I know when to be aware and to react. So I think that's really important, even for everybody listening. You know, just like I as a medical student, just because you learn about it does not mean you have it. It just right. means now you know to look for it. Do you think we don't know enough about menopause and perimenopause for women we don't talk about it and then when the symptoms happen women like Halle Berry even who obviously is a very (laughs) well-learned woman she knows her body Mm -hmm. she knows she's an intelligent woman and yet still we don't know what's happening yeah I think perimenopause and menopause is an area that we are just now starting to to hear about talk doctors are talking about and I think that's wonderful I mean even when I did the palpitations video I had so many people say you know I had this at perimenopause and this came on. And so I think it's wonderful. I think we are at the very beginning of being able to say, here are all the symptoms that you can have. Here's what they mean. Here's when you can just chalk it up to perimenopause and menopause. And here's when to seek care. We're just starting to do that. We're kind of, you know, where we were maybe in terms of like fertility, talking about infertility 10 years ago is now where we are for perimenopause. And I think that's wonderful. Like, let's talk about it. You know, I think it's great to know that you can, at perimenopause, you can have that kind of pain. So, okay, now women know not to just write it off, but now, okay, so now let's tell them when you need to go see a doctor for it and what can be done. What is perimenopause? Yes, <laughs> TJ just raised his hand like he was in class. I know. It's, I feel like we're in medical school class. Do I get like my chalkboard? And be like, now here's a uterus. If you need no, to, it, the diagram will be helpful. But yes, we talk about it. menopause is one thing, but you say, uh, but to that point, and I didn't want to sit here kind of embarrassed, but I, I hear menopause. No. That's one thing I understand, but it's not talked about to your point enough. We don't mm-hmm. talk about perimenopause to the point. So I hear it rolling off you all's tongues. I couldn't define what we're talking right. about. And TJ, I'm so glad you asked. And to be clear, I was laughing, not at you asking the question, but more how cutely you kind of like raised your hand <laughs> like teacher. So I think that's wonderful. So menopause, obviously, or men, not obviously, menopause is when our bo- a woman's body kind of ceases to be able to bear children and all the hormonal things but, so that come with that. But that's kind of how we often think about it. Perimenopause can be a number of years uh, during before that actual finality where you might have hormone fluctuations, uh, irregular cycles, temperature right cycle fluctuations, all sorts of things. We're realizing that can happen two, three, four years before actual menopause actually happens. So it's that transition period. There is also sometimes people argue, say there is menopause that men go through their own side transitions at some point, but that's 
discussion for another day. Ah, what yeah. what what age does that start to happen? We'll, we'll get you back on that. One. We, we'll follow up later on that one, Doc. We'll, we don't have time for that. She's like, and uh, next. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Doc? Can I ask you? I only have a couple more things for you, and one of them is, um, what do you Google? What do you find yourself Googling? You know, you know, good and hell well, you shouldn't be trying to find an answer somewhere on Google to something going on with you medically. So what? So what if we all somebody do. looks at if somebody looks at my Google TJ, they probably think I'm a serial killer. So oh, um, <laughs> I'll explain. Hold on, okay. that needs to have context, okay? Yes. So just realize that's a soundbite that y'all aren't going to use on. No. <laughs> um, so as you know, you just you know, I, I'd had my crazy heart stuff. I'd had this scare. We were. I was trying to have another child. I dealt with all this infertility and it's really awful, scary struggles. Um, and in the end, had baby number three, you know, four years later mm-hmm. in July. That's, and um, coming out of that, now it's my third child, but he's much younger than my other children, realizing I needed to baby proof my home and we have to redo everything. And also realizing like, as a mom that I had stressed about a lot of things with my first two kids that were unnecessary and maybe misplaced stress. And as an ER doctor saying, seeing the outcomes you have with little children and saying, okay, how can I make child safety, baby safety easier for parents and use it? Start at the outcomes. What are the bad things we want to avoid that I see as an ER doctor? And let's work backwards to protect them. And those are the things that parents need to do. Again, how can I simplify baby proofing and baby safety and child safety so that baby safe and you as the parent have peace of mind? So I'm working on that course right now. We're launching it in a few weeks. So if you, but every once in a while, I'll just do a quick Google search to search and it will be things like top ways children choke or most poisonous things for children. Just trying to see what's in the the common vernacular. Like, man, if somebody looks at my Google search, they're going to, Deepax is going to call me. So (laughs) y'all just know you, this is my testimony that that is just being researched for my Google, for my baby proofing course. Uh, These are the things that, again, as ER doctors, we think of all the emergencies. She just set up an alibi, didn't she? That's hilarious. Yes. Yes, I did. I did. (laughs) And and calling my lawyers after as an ER doctor and a mom, what do you worry about most with your kids? Depends my age, but it's interesting, Amy. One thing I real I didn't know, and in researching the baby proofing course, um, the number one cause of death in a ch- infant under one is death while they sleep. Not cause, not call, including SIDS, but literally suffocation in their crib or you know wherever they're sleeping. And I realized if you can make your baby sleep space safe, that accounts for 82% of all infant deaths in that first year, Wow! which was just kind of mind blowing to me to say, okay, if, if I can just help parents get a safe baby space, we're worrying about all the other things that we're doing, you know, outlet everything for your child, you know, plug all the outlets, do all the things, but let's focus on the baby sleep space. And that was just, it was like, that's 82% of that in the first year. That's huge. So things like that, you know, and um, so in the first year, it's that, you know, and, and then of course, we're, we're in the process of, with a pool. I always worry about pool and water safety for kids. Those are one of the things that kind of, for children under one, it's a bathtub. For children above one, it's a pool or a lake. So always making sure that, you know, that your children know how to swim early. I was really surprised from the car submersion video. So many people said they don't know how to swim. Mm. Um, and how can you get your kids not just comfortable in the water, but actually knowing how to swim? I always think, because you see kids with swimmies and doing things. I say, I want my child to, their skill needs to match their level of comfort. So I do not put my kids in the pool in a swimming because I don't want them to feel comfortable in the pool unless they can swim. I want them to feel you know, adequately uncomfortable until they can float over on their back and and float to the edge. Um, Dr. So. Daria, if you were given the power, uh, I don't know, if you could wave a wand or you were given power by the government to change everybody's behavior, there a lifestyle change that everybody could make that would severely reduce the number of ER visits you get, that would reduce the number of times people end up in the hospital with some issue, what lifestyle change for all of us would you recommend we all stop doing or do less of or do more of? What lifestyle change would you give to every single person out there? Oof. Um, off the top of my head, I'm going to say looking at your phone while driving. Oh, wow. Because 
Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm going to say that and making sure that your kids are in the right car seats. Oh, wow. Um, Mm. As uh, those are the two things there, you know, looking at your phone while driving, because either you can hit somebody or, you know, the most heartbreaking cases I see in the ER is like the person, the patient in front of me who is now so injured, they didn't do anything wrong. They were hit by somebody else. And, you know, if potentially if they'd been looking up or been more aware, could they have avoided that versus also like looking at your phone and you can cause an accident. So that's the first. And also if you're looking at your phone and your kids are watching, then when your kids are driving, they will be looking at their phones. So that's it. And then working in the pediatrics ER, the number of kids who you see who get injured in a car accident, who if they had been properly restrained in the right car seat, in the right area of the car, I hate that. I hate that because that's something that would have been preventive and I hate it for the kid and I hate it for the parents because the parents feel that guilt that they did not do that. And often there's parents who thought they were doing the right thing, which is why I do so much on social media to help parents know what they need to be doing. You said the right space in the car. Where is the right space in the car? So for children 12 and under, that's in the second row. Um, And, you know, that also means we see parents do things like they turn the car seat around too soon. Your, your children's vertebrae is just not formed in the first couple of years of life. So they need to be backwards. You know, they, they're not cr- cramped. They need to be backwards. They, their spines can't handle it. Or you see kids who aren't in a booster um, and, you know, they're just not large enough for the seatbelt to adequately take care of them. I took care of a little guy who had literally like it, it ripped his kidney because he was not in a booster and the seatbelt hit him at the wrong mm. spot. So those are the ones that are heartbreaking are the ones that like, this was, I mean, all accidents are technically preventable, but things like that are, are really preventable. And that's, that's what I really hate. No front seat before the age of 12. Yeah, before actually 13. 13. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, 13. Mm-hmm. and so when I see little kids get in the front seat, also drives me crazy. <laughs> drives me crazy. Um, put them in the back, put them in the back and put them in a booster for goodness sake. I don't care that they don't like it. Um, I did have some people say they showed their kids were arguing about riding in a booster. So they just showed them my video. I'm like, great. Make me be the bad guy. I am happy to say blame it on Dr. Daria. It's so interesting because I thought you were going to say something about smoking or drinking, salt, salt, diet. But the truth is you're an ER doctor and you see emergencies, you see accidents and car driving in a car is probably the most dangerous thing any of us do at any point. It, it is. It's the one that's most dangerous, like in that moment. Yes, salt and smoking and all of those. Those get said a lot. I, th- I felt like those, you know, we needed to shed some uh, love on other things. But, you know, cars are it can be killing machines. Like they are, they are wonderful things, but they are also so dangerous. And people forget that because we drive so commonly. No, Dr. Doria, that's a great, no, no, no. It's you great. gave us something to think about that we don't think about enough in that, you, yes, you could cause an accident by hitting someone, but you also aren't paying attention to avoid somebody hitting you. And then mm-hmm. you're giving some bad habits to some bad drivers that you're raising in the back mm-hmm. seat who are seeing it. That, yes. that is great. Yeah. No, I mean, we see we see it with people walking, going down the Oof. escalators. We were subway <laughs> folks and we walk. So we see, you know, everyone is just on their phone. And, and, and I will yeah. actually I will say I'm guilty of it, too. But when you see other people just we're walking, that's dangerous enough. But in the car, it's happening, too. We're just you know, we're not seeing it as much. So yes. I think that's such a good reminder of what an, a very preventable situation yeah. by just putting that phone mm-hmm. away, um, whether you're yeah. navigating and using ways or you're messaging or whatever. It's it's not safe. There's no scenario mm-hmm. in which it's safe. There isn't it in car accidents happen so, so quickly that no, you, you, you can't look down for a second. Well, uh, we want to thank you, Dr. Daria Long, Harvard and Yale trained emergency physician. Uh, it was so great to be able to talk to you and, and hear your advice for so many of us who can do things better and just be reminded of what we can do to prepare. I think that's one of my mm-hmm. biggest takeaways is if you're prepared or at least you have some semblance of knowledge about what to do when or if that moment happens, you're ready to do it. So thank yeah. you very much, uh-huh. Dr. Daria. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, TJ. It was such a pleasure for you both. I'll email you about menopause. (laughs) (laughs) Give me a call. Talk to you soon, TJ. (laughs) 